We have been sitting for 90 minutes. Please stand up just for 15 seconds. If you need to do a resistance exercise, you may do that. Uh, this is good for our physical health and good for our mental health. Okay, thank you. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today about uh, the effects of strength training on mental health. I come from Athens, Georgia. It's about 110 kilometers from Atlanta. I work at the University of Georgia. There's been some impressive findings that have come from the university. Uh, Crawford Long is the first to uh, discover anesthesia in the 1840s. Uh, more recently, Greg Robinson. Uh, he is a organic, or excuse me, an inorganic chemist, and he won a uh, Alexander Van Humboldt Award and spent last year working at the Technical University of Berlin. And if you come to visit me in Athens, uh, we can see some college football. University of Georgia has a good team, and it's a music town. So uh, if you're in your 50s, you may have heard of the band REM, and if you're in your 20s, you may have heard of the band of Montreal. So today I'll focus on the effects of strength training on six aspects of mental health. Energy, anxiety, depression, pain, sleep, and cognitive function. So the first thing that I need to say, of course there's not much strength training with uh, the youngest of the young, but the first thing I need to point out is that Exercise scientists have not focused on strength training when examining psychological outcomes. So this slide shows the percentage of studies that have focused on strength training in four of the main mental health categories. And as you can see, only between 10 and 2% uh, of the studies have focused on strength training. All my comments today will focus on strength training, but as you see, we don't know enough. So we need to know more. There'll be a, a different story, maybe a better story, in the next decade. So let's turn to feelings of energy uh, first. Everybody wants to feel more energetic. You can learn more, learn faster, could be more productive, and you can enjoy life to a better extent. Unfortunately, a great many of us are tired. So when you look at the large epidemiological studies done in primarily Western industrialized countries, this is, they consistently show, depending upon how it's defined, about 15 to 30 percent of the population reports a severe fatigue. Moreover, women more fatigued than men. Uh, no surprise that people with an illness or medical condition they're more fatigued than those who are healthy, but very consistently, people who are physically inactive report being more fatigued than people who are uh, regularly active. And this has a cost to our society. So one estimate globally was $500 billion each year associated with treating fatigue. So some of the cost is healthcare costs, some is from accidents when people are fatigued. And then uh, the big cost is lost productivity at work. And I won't show slides for all the other psychological variables like this because there's not enough time. But for all these psychological variables I'll talk about, anxiety, depression, sleep problems, pain, and uh, cognitive function, there's a high prevalence and a high cost to society. So if we could do good things using physical activity and strength training to improve these, not only do individuals benefit, our economies benefit as well. So first I want to talk about pregnant women. So pregnant women, a lot of them are tired. And they also do not want to take medications for being tired. Same thing with other psychiatric problems like anxiety and depression. The concern is the medicines can hurt the baby. When women get pregnant, they also tend to reduce their activity levels. So it's a time where the families and friends say, I'll get that, honey. You sit down and relax. Uh, in the United States, the obstetricians will tell uh, pregnant women, 
don't lift any more than 25 pounds. And this is because they don't have the evidence base to know if it's safe or effective. So we were funded from the National Institutes of Health to do a randomized controlled trial of safety and efficacy of strength training with pregnant women. And these were pregnant women who had not lifted weights before. So they're adopting it in their second trimester, so about 24 weeks of gestation, and then through 36 weeks. So 12-week strength training program, as you can see, with legs, uh, leg press, leg extension, leg curl, leg pull, and a lumbar extension machine. Uh, I think Dr. Graves talked about this yesterday. And with two sets, 15 reps, uh, with a standard type of rest and uh, work interval, but low to moderate intensity exercise for these pregnant women. And uh, it was, uh, the, the external load was influenced by their perception of effort. So once they felt the load uh, was easier, then we increased the load. And these pregnant women could increase their external load by 36 to 50 percent, depending upon the exercise. So pregnant women can safely uh, lift weights and do exercise training. So this slide shows the results for energy for each single bout of exercise. So their feelings of energy were measured before the workout and after the workout for the 24 different workouts. And you could see that uh, only for about 10% of the workouts, maybe two out of 24, was there a trivial increase in energy. The dashed line shows what would most people would consider a meaningful improvement in feelings of energy. And then it's important sometimes to look at each individual. So scientists focus on group data sometimes and it can be influenced by an influential data point or two. So if you look at the average across all 24 bouts for each of the 26 people, there's about 20% that don't feel much different. Some get a little worse. And then about 80% feel more energetic, some dramatically so. One of the factors that uh, we think influences this is where they start. So some people start their workout, they have a lot of energy that day, and so they don't improve very much. The ones who get the biggest benefit are the ones who come in tired. So this slide summarizes the entire literature. So these are uh, results of a meta-analysis of 16 experiments with uh, 678 participants. And they've done a single bout of exercise. And in addition to looking at the change in energy with exercise, they subtract the change that happens in a non-exercise control condition. And so with, stre oops, with strength training, we see one quarter of a standard deviation improvement. This is a small but still a meaningful improvement in feelings of energy for uh, people who do strength training. It's less, about half, compared to aerobic training. And so I'll come back to why I think that's the case uh, in just a minute. This study with the pregnant women involved training as well. So this slide shows the results for the 12-week training part. Pregnant women were randomly assigned to strength training or a attention control condition, pregnancy education. And then a third control condition, which is weight lift, where they're tested, tested again, and they look at those changes over time. You can see that the uh, weight list control, most of these women had less energy over 12 weeks. There's a few that improved. Similar with the education control, but the strength training group, there were fewer people with less energy, more with an increase in energy. And so the evidence shows that given the average during pregnancy reduction in feelings of energy, if women do strength training, they will uh, attenuate that reduction in energy. This slide summarizes the whole literature. And so there was a meta-analysis published in, that involved 70 randomized controlled trials. These are with 
uh, half of them people with medical uh, problems, half of uh, healthy adults, and more than 6,800 participants. And there was a significant increase in energy for those who did strength training that was greater than the effect for aerobic training and greater when strength and aerobic uh, workouts were included. However, only five of these trials were done. So there's just not been enough of these trials to um, really get a precise estimate of that effect size. Let's now turn to the effects of exercise uh, or strength training on anxiety. First, with a single bout of exercise, here the participants did three sets of 10 repetitions, knee extension, knee flexion, chest press, sh shoulder press, lat pull, and abdominal curl. And they did this three different times, once at 40% uh, of their 10 repetition max, once at 60% of their 10 repetition max, and another day, 80% uh, of their 10 repetition max, and then a control condition. And as you can see, the moderate exercise, 60%, they start here, and they do the exercise bout, and then post-exercise, especially at 90 minutes and longer, they have a reduction in their uh, symptoms of anxiety. So it's lower than what they were and significantly lower than the control group. So these data show that anxiety can be reduced after a single bout of strength training. The effect seems to be best for moderate intensity strength training. And then a meta-analysis of this literature has been done recently, and they show the effect is smaller for strength training compared to aerobic and delayed, meaning the aerobic folks get the benefit maybe within 20 minutes after exercise. And I'll come back to this difference between strength and aerobic in just uh, one more or two more slides. This slide shows the uh, a literature, a review of the literature that's looked at the effects of strength training on anxiety. So there's only a handful of trials, and they all show positive effects. I have highlighted uh, one of the experiments that randomly assigned people to do either a higher intensity, a 80% of 1RM, or a lower intensity, uh, which is 50 to 60% of their 1RM. And as you can see, there's a better benefit with the moderate intensity strength training for helping people to feel more calm. Note that this is healthy adults. These are not people with anxiety disorders or anxiety problems. So it's rather remarkable that people, even who aren't nervous and anxious, go work out, still feel a little better. There have been uh, studies, and one a very interesting one was strength training uh, with people with generalized anxiety disorder. And so these are the folks who stand to benefit the most from the strength training. These are people who are worrying a lot excessively uh, for six months. It has a dramatic effect on their ability to function, to hold a job, and they're very distressed by it. And so this is a uh, psychiatric disorder. But the unique uh, part of this investigation that uh, links to several of the other comments made uh, yesterday with regards to the challenge of equating uh, resistance exercise and aerobic type of exercise. So what these investigators did was to try to match strength training and aerobic training. So this was cycling exercise for the aerobic training. So for the strength training, they did no arm exercise, it's just legs. And they did three different uh, leg activities, leg press, leg curl, and leg extension. Six weeks, twice a week, seven sets, 10 reps. And they were trying to match the amount of active time for the strength training and the aerobic training and the external work. Okay, the total work was matched for those conditions, as well as the progression across tra training of 5% per week. So I, I'm emphasizing this because I think some of these prior studies that show a better effect for aerobic exercise compared to strength training 
is because typically they're matched on t workout time. So if, we, if I go jog for 45 minutes, or I go lift weights for 45 minutes, the weightlifting has rests, pause, between sets. So the total work can be less with strength training compared to aerobic training. So there is a need, I think, to move forward in a good way to try to match if we're interested in, in comparing aerobic and strength training. So what these investigators found, uh, they had 30 women with generalized anxiety disorder. All uh, of the women at the beginning had this disorder. Six weeks later, some had had a remission. Their symptoms had reduced to the extent that the clinical psychologist decided that they were in remission from the disorder. The most were in uh, the uh, strength training group, significantly better than the aerobic group. So strength training may be especially powerful uh, if you give it a chance by matching it to aerobic training. And if you're a clinician treating patients, then you would need to see only three uh, clients and treat them with resistance exercise to get one improvement. If, the, if these data, and it's a small pilot study, if they generalize, then you would need with aerobic training to treat 10 patients to get one improvement. So strength training appears to be powerful for this particular psychi psychiatric disorder. Let's turn to another psychiatric disorder, which is depression. And first, unlike anxiety, if people are depressed, or people are, uh, are uh, not depressed, and they do exercise, that does not seem to help them become even less depressed or very, very extremely happy. So exercise can help with depression, though it's primarily helping people who have some symptoms to begin with. So one group of patients with some symptoms are those with a medical condition like a, a heart disease, a heart attack, cancer. And then uh, in the studies that uh, have looked at effects on depression symptoms, strength training does help, and the uh, size of the effect is small, but in about equivalent to what happens with aerobic training or mixed training. When you work with uh, depressive patients, the effect size is four times as large. So you see the 0.3 uh, standard deviation with the medical patients, and then it goes up to 1.2 with the depressed patients. So it makes good sense. You get a bigger effect for those people who have more severe symptoms. And the strength training has a larger effect than aerobic training for the uh, depressed patient. By the way, if you overtrain, there's a strong literature for athletes that shows you can take a mentally healthy athlete and produce depression symptoms, and even in some, a depression from the high intensity training. So exercise uh, is a bit like a drug. It can, depending upon the dose, help people or it can make them worse. So in terms of the psychology, uh, it's, it's very sensitive to that dose. Everyone knows if they've lifted heavy weights that that can cause pain. It hurts. Um, fewer people know that you can treat pain with exercise and with strength training. So let's talk about both of those. First, uh, with just a single bout of exercise, short, three-minute hand grip exercise, 25% of a person's max, that can induce a hypoalgesia. So this is one example of the studies that have been done on this. And before the exercise, they give a noxious stimulus to the forefinger. So 3,000 grams of pressure and they keep the pressure there for three minutes. They ask them about pain intensity every 30 seconds. And as you can see, there's an increase in pain intensity. Then they do the hand grip exercise. And you can see that there's a reduction of the pain response to the exact same exercise or the exact same pressure stimulus. This has been tried with a number of different stimuli. It's a very consistent uh, effect for reducing pain and it's uh, particularly uh, large. The effects are a little bit larger with uh, strength training. Sometimes it's uh, thought to be related to turning on of our endogenous opioid system. In this study, as you can see, there was no effect of the opioid blocker naltrexone, but in other studies that has been observed. So the 
pain reduc reducing effect of exercise is quite pl uh, plausibly related to uh, brain opioid mechanisms. On the other side, you can cause a lot of pain with high intensity exercise. Worst case uh, scenario, exertional uh, rhabdomyolysis, when people can actually die if they injure enough of their muscle and you have proteins come out into the blood and the kidney cannot handle those. But as uh, I think most of the people in this room would know that with high intensity, eccentrically biased exercise, you can produce muscle injury and pain. And it's related to intensity. In this study, they controlled the total work. So with a higher intensity, 120% of maximum voluntary concentric contraction. So they can only lift 100 pounds, say, but they can lower 120. They're stronger doing the eccentrics. And so at 120, they only uh, did f uh, 30 eccentric uh, arm flexions or extensions but they did more at the lower intensity condition. So this effect is unrelated to the total work and very much related to the intensity of the, of the external load. Another issue related to pain is that, especially when we get older, people are living in some pain. And so it could be from uh, hip or knee osteoarthritis or low back pain. And so uh, when you ask older people, as this, in, these investigators did with more than 1,000 people, 55 and older, they, uh, when asked, why do you not do exercise, they have a lot of reasons. Don't have enough time. They're tired. Uh, nobody to work with. I don't know how to do it. I'm not in good enough health. Uh, I, d I don't care. But pain is a common uh, reason why people don't exercise. So this is a barrier to exercise. And it's a paradox that we need to overcome if we want to help people because they benefit from the exercise. If they're willing to go through the pain, not a bad, dangerous pain like a heart attack, but a good, healthy pain, if they can learn what that is and put up with it, they get long-term benefits from the strength training. So let's look at the literature on this. This, this slide shows a summary of all the randomized controlled trials that are looking at the effect of strength training on patients with low back pain. So there's been 11, all but this first one, show a positive effect for exercise, meaning after uh, considering the change in the control group, there was a reduction in pain that was greater for those who did the strength training. The magnitude of the effect, a half a standard deviation. This is a clinically meaningful effect. It's worth it for uh, people like yourselves to do the strength training with people with low back pain because for most people it will provide some benefit. This slide shows the randomized controlled trials looking at the effects of strength training and other kinds of exercise for people with knee osteoarthritis. There's more studies with strength training for those with knee osteoarthritis, 32 studies in this meta-analytic uh, analytic review. And there's greater reduction in pain with exercise to the right of this solid line. Only one or two show no benefit. Most show a benefit. But also, these investigators wanted to see why are some of these even the best benefit? Why do you get a couple trials where people get the most uh, benefit. And uh, in their analysis, what they pointed to was those are the studies that are focusing on quadricep strength compared to the other studies that did strength in the, the whole uh, leg. So doing calf-related exercises and so on. So th these data suggest that maybe for people with knee osteoarthritis, really getting the strength in the quadriceps back uh, will help the function and help with pain. Let's uh, next turn to the effects of strength training on sleep. And so you need to know that there's a strong relationship between sleep and mental health. People who have poor sleep will often have then mental troubles. People with mental health problems don't get good sleep. So the two are very strongly linked. 
There's been at least two randomized trials looking at the effects of strength training on self-reports of sleep. And these are in people with symptoms of depression. And what they've found <clears throat> is positive. This slide shows one of the studies by Dr. Singh, published in 2005. And you can see that at the beginning, the uh, strength training group has more sleep problems. The higher the bar, the worse the sleep. And then after training, the sleep improves. There's fewer problems with a little bit of worsening for the education control group. So self-reported sleep uh, is different than objective, polysomnographically measured sleep. It's more expensive to do it that way. There aren't many trials. I'm, I'm aware of at least one with strength training. And here, the goal of the investigators was actually to try to disturb sleep with uh, eccentric exercise as a way then to study sleep disturbances in the lab. Their hope was to cause people to sleep very poorly. And they were quite disappointed when that did not happen. So it turns out when you measure uh, polysomnographic sleep and look at wakefulness after sleep onset, or you look at slow wave sleep or rapid eye movement REM sleep, you get relatively small changes. There's many other sleep variables, how long it takes you to fall asleep, and stage two, stage three. But they've, uh, I've put here only where there was the biggest changes. The biggest change was in rapid eye movement sleep. This is worth a couple minutes of rapid eye movement sleep. It's unclear that that would have any meaningful effect. So I think the good news is you can do strength training. You can get sore. It's unlikely to really have a major uh, sleep disturbance for you. The final uh, topic is then effects of exercise on uh, cognitive function or effect of strength training on cognitive function. And uh, I want to start with an uh, epidemiological study that we've recently done. This is using uh, people who go to a website called Luminosity. And on that website, they can play computer games. And this analysis is limited to one game called Lost in Migration. So as you can see on the screen comes up birds. And on some screens, all the birds are going in one direction. On other uh, screens, as shown here, the center bird is going a different direction. So your task is to press a key of the direction of the center bird and to ignore the flanking birds, they're called. And so it's a way to look at how well people are attending. And if you aren't paying attention, you're, you make mistakes. And uh, this slide is showing the number of screens. They get 45 seconds for this test. It doesn't look at the reaction time because people have different computer equipment and different connections, and it makes those data a little more error prone. So here we're looking at just how many screens they get through in 45 seconds. And then uh, <clears throat> the data are shown in relation to the number of strength training bouts per week that these people said they did. Never rarely, one through seven. And you can see there's quite a few, 8,666. About 40% never do or rarely do strength training by self-report. About 55%, one, two, or three strength training bouts per week. And then about 5% do more than that. And so if you just look at the raw data, it shows, well, if you do more bouts of strength training, you perform better than if you do never or rarely. But with epidemiology data, there's always confounds. Might be something else that's causing this relationship. And here, an obvious probability is the age. right? So those who are doing better are younger. And those who are doing more strength training bouts per week are younger. And so the older folks are slower, maybe because of the strength training, but maybe because of other things. So this is why <clears throat> we want to go into the lab and look at more controlled studies. And this is a uh, study that was uh, a summary of a meta-analysis conducted by a group from Illinois. And it's looking at older adults. And what they found is that in the studies that added strength training, they got more improvement with cognitive function than compared to those studies that only did aerobic training. The limitation here is 
many of these studies were not the uh, gold standard randomized controlled trial study. So if we look at those uh, at least seven randomized controlled trial investigations, those show positive results for older adults in terms of improving cognitive function. The, the study I'm highlighting here was with 155 women age 65 to 75. They're doing twi twice weekly, two sets, six to eight repetitions of bicep curls, tricep extension, seated row, lat pull, leg press, hamstring curls, calf raises for 12 months. And those who did the stretching didn't change, but those who did the strength training improved on a Stroop task. This is uh, reading as fast as you can words. So you would read, uh, re you would say green, red, blue in one condition, that's the control. But then on the next trial, you have to read the color of the ink that the word is in. So you would read uh, blue, green, and red. And you see I've slowed down because it's a harder cognitive task. So the preliminary evidence is quite good for older adults with strength training as it could help aspects of their cognitive function. So with the last minute or two that I have, I just want to mention, ah, thank you. possible explanations as to why or how exercise could help. So strength training might be able to help mental health by improving the vascular system in a lot of ways. So for older people uh, who might be getting dementia, maybe there's a reduction in uh, plaque in their arteries, uh, maybe the nitric oxide, other factors can open the vessels better. Uh, and there's some data in rodents to show that you can increase capillary, uh, capillaries in places like the hippocampus. So it's at least uh, possible in rats that you could have some benefits. And th uh, that's, those are the reasons that people are giving as to why it might help the brain of uh, humans as well. But also there's a number of other factors that can influence how your brain functions. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor was mentioned as uh, something that uh, might change with exercise and that could help support neural function. Uh, yesterday we heard about the myokines and the cytokines that can act on the brain and those might provide some anti-inflammation effect <clears throat> that would support better mood, better cognitive function, and better sleep and so on. But then there are the main neurotransmitter systems known to be involved in a lot of these functions. So when you strength train and do other forms of exercise, the nerves from the muscle are going back to the spinal cord and to the brain and can release these neurotransmitters and alter receptors for those transmitters and change the chemical balance. And that is thought to be also a key reason with uh, why exercise might help without getting into the details. And then lastly, uh, it might be more of a psychological phenomenon, although placebo effects have a biological basis, but people hear about the benefits of exercise and read about it, and their friends tell them about it. They come to expect the benefit. And so there's been a handful of experiments that are randomized controlled trials where they have an exercise arm, a control arm, and then a placebo arm. It might be a placebo pill, or uh, we've even tried to do fictive exercise, passive exercise, where people's limbs are moved for them to fool them into think that they are doing exercise when it's really uh, very trivial. And those uh, experiments, if you <clears throat> put them all together, then you get improvement in mental health, but when you compare the placebo effect to the control and you compare the exercise effect to the control, about half of it seems to be due to expectations and placebo. There's more work that needs to be done in this regard, but it, it could be that our benefits psychologically partially due to expectations. D don't let that prevent you from allowing your clients to benefit from that. This is what physicians do. Uh, they want to maximize a placebo effect as well as any of the 
biological effect from the medicine. Okay, so the short story is, the Greeks knew it, and we're now putting some details on it, but strong body, strong mind. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for one to three questions. Ein bis drei Fragen. Sie haben von den äh, negativen Auswirkungen von hochintensiven Belastungen gesprochen. Äh, vor dem Hintergrund einer rein gesundheitlichen Anwendung beim Krafttraining oder gesundheitsfördernden Anwendung beim Krafttraining, würden Sie hochintensive Belastungen lieber unterlassen oder äh, ich sag mal eher wohl dosiert setzen wollen? So I didn't bring my translation. So. The, the question was that you talked about the negative effect of very high intensive um, um, exercise um, protocols. So would you still recommend high intensity training based on what you told us? Yeah. It depends on your goal. So if you're an athlete in training and you have a goal to perform well, of course you have to train hard. So if you're talking about uh, individuals who really seek to achieve their, their optimum, then it's beneficial for them to train hard. Um, Thank you. Nächste Frage. Das Mikro kommt. Ich habe eine Frage zur Schmerzhemmung. Bei chronischen Schmerzen kann man mit Ausdauersport die Schmerzen lindern durch die Aktivierung des antinozizeptiven deszendierenden Systems. Das klappt aber erst nach ca. 30 Minuten Ausdauersport. Ich hatte Sie vorhin so verstanden, dass bei akuten Schmerzen Kraftsport schon nach kurzer Zeit Schmerzen lindert. Gilt das auch für chronischen Schmerz? Oh, yes, very much so. So the, the knee pain, the uh, low back pain I emphasize, but there's good data on other kinds of pain as well. There's a group of patients with a fibromyalgia and they suffer from uh, multi uh, pain in different parts of the body. They benefit from chronic training as well. And the, the effects are uh, moderate to large for the, this group of patients. So, and very consistent. So absolutely. Thank you very much.